This is the last presentation of Making Sense of It All. So far, we've answered a number of questions. We've discovered that we have an enemy. We've discovered that he is on our track. We've discovered that he hates God, 100% hatred for God. And because we are made in his image, then Satan hates the human race too. And so we have discovered some of the answers to our questions of why we don't have any order in the world. But the big question is, is this going to go on forever? Will there be no end to it? I want you to think of a Roman amphitheatre, a circular structure, and down in the centre, on the sand, surrounded by many, many spectators, are the inhabitants of our world. With the inhabitants of our world is the devil, and people are watching to see what is happening. It is going to be the grandest, last act of a very spectacular play and it's building up to a stupendous climax. None of us can be just observers in this final act. We have to be on either one side or the other, on the side of good or on the side of evil. At the present time there is only a small group of people who are on the side of God and that small group of people are faced by a huge wave of enmity. It is very difficult to cope with, but as we watch we will see what happens. We can see that that tide of evil that is sweeping round the world is still holding hostages. And this play will go on until the very last hostage has decided to come out and move over to the side of Christ. All heaven is watching this to see what will happen. But what characterizes the evil that's in the world? It's double dealing, it's deceptions, it's delusions, but above all things Satan uses agents. He himself does not appear in the world. He has told the people in the world, or he's given them the oppression, that he is just a comedy figure. So many people don't even believe that there is a devil. They think of someone with hooves and horns and tail. But yet the Bible tells us that he is a real being. He is real. He's on our track. He is a fallen angel. And in this last act, we shall see him in all his intentions. When you go to a theatre, Sometimes you will buy a program, and that program will give you the synopsis of the play that you're about to watch. And this play is no different. God has given us the synopsis of this play. It is not a play, of course, it is real. It is a very real struggle that is happening, involving all of us. But without the Bible, we would not know where that struggle was taking us. So let us look at the play sheet and discover exactly what Satan is doing. Satan only works through agents. He's worked through agents right from the beginning. Do you remember we talked about the tree that Eve went to and heard the talking serpent? That was the agent that Satan worked through then. Then we find him talking through Pharaoh. And he says through Pharaoh, Who is the Lord? I don't know God. I know not the Lord. And then we find him a little further down in history, and we find him through Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. The Babylonians persecuted the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar built a grand image, and he asked people, when they heard the music, to bow down and worship that image. But in that vast crowd that were kneeling, three remained standing. They were the children of God. You see, it's always only been a small number who will follow God. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious, he had those three young men bound and thrown into a fiery furnace. The furnace was so hot 
that had even killed the soldiers who threw them in. And yet, when he looked again, he saw that there were four in the furnace, and the three young men were walking. The ropes that they'd been tied up with were burnt off, but not them. And he summoned them out of the furnace to come to him, and they said they would serve no other god except the true God. They would not bow down to idols or worship false gods. Then we come a little bit further down in history and we discover the Medes and the Persians and Darius. And their way of working was to make decrees. Darius made a decree about worship and he signed it. And that was to say that for 30 days no one was to worship any god except him. Daniel heard of this decree. He went to his room, and Daniel was the prime minister of the country. He went to his room, he opened the windows, he knelt in front of the window in full public view, and he worshipped his God against the decree, a single man against the decree of a whole country. He was thrown into the lion's den but he was delivered. God gave a witness to Darius. Then we come further down in history and we find the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire had a much more subtle approach to destroying the ways of God. The Greek Empire brought in philosophy, but one philosophy of Satan especially, and that was through Plato. And Plato taught that when we are born, we are born immortal. We do not die. When we leave this earth, we just go on to live somewhere else. And nowadays, I would think that almost everybody in the world believes that, that we have a soul that goes on to live somewhere out of sight. And then we come to Rome. Rome are always the persecutors. Rome in prophecy is described as an iron kingdom a harsh, bloodthirsty kingdom that has destroyed God's people by the thousand in an amphitheatre. And now today it's as if we are in the amphitheatre again and we're meeting the final challenge of the adversary. Do you remember at the beginning that Satan wanted to have a kingdom, a territory and subjects and people and laws now he has almost achieved that. At the very beginning, he attacked God's law and he said to Eve, God has said that you will die, but I say, you will not die. There was the Greek philosophy, but now it is still continuing. Satan has changed one of God's Ten Commandments and he has changed it not in the Bible, but in the catechisms, the biggest religion of the world. And there he has changed God's creation Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, to Sunday. And when he is asked how this happens, he says, it is through the authority of the church. Satan believes that he has the authority to countermand everything that God has done. God says, when you die, you sleep. Satan says, no. When you die, you carry on living somewhere else. He has his institution in place, but he does not have all the world on his side as yet. But that is what he is aiming for. Today, politicians refer to it as the one world government. And that one world government will affect everything in our world. Finance, politics, education, whatever it be, it will be a global, international experience. In fact, if you think about it, we already have a new international Bible. And that Bible does not say the same things as God has said. The changes are small and subtle, but they add up, basically, to doing away with Christ. 
he is just referred to as he, not as God. Satan, in the New International Bible, takes the name of Christ and makes it his own, the morning star, as Jesus is called in Revelation. It is a very subtle change, but a strong influence towards this one world government. Satan knows that commerce is not enough to hold the world together. It needs religion. And if you remember, he is a spiritual being, and therefore he is going to have a spiritual kingdom in the world. So don't be surprised that this talk is about religion, because that is what Satan is. Satan is not an atheist being. Satan knows there is a God, but he wants to be God. And more than anything else, he wants the worship. And so he is now setting everything in place where he must be worshipped and not God. This is why the day of worship has been changed. It is part of his plan. I wonder if you'd realised just how definitely Satan is trying to be the God of this world. When we read the writings that come from the Vatican, we discover that there the Pope is referred to as the Lord God the Pope or sweet Jesus on earth, or the vicar of Christ. And that's an important one, because a vicar is someone who stands in. In England, we used to have a rector, but if the rector, who was the minister of the church, didn't want to do his job, and he wanted to travel in Europe, for instance, as a tutor for a wealthy young man, he would put in place a vicar a stand-in, and this gives us the clue as to how Satan works. Satan is acting as the stand-in for God in this world. You might even say an imposter standing in for God, because Satan has no life. Satan has never done anything good for anyone. Satan has never created anything. He can only take what's already in existence and destroy it, just like he is trying to destroy human beings by various means. When we use the word Antichrist, we're actually taking a word from the New Testament, and the New Testament was written in Greek. An Antichrist in Greek does not mean someone who is against Christ or hates Christ, but someone who is standing in for Christ. And so we can see that when Christian churches of old referred to the papacy as the Antichrist, then they were saying that the papacy, the Vatican, is the stand-in for Christ in this world. It's a strong statement, but it is a biblical statement. It is not my own philosophy. It comes from God's word when he has warned us what will happen in this last act. But without the information given in the Bible, how can we genuinely make a decision for or against Christ unless we have the information? It's the same with everything else in the world. Unless we have the full information, we're not going to make a true decision. And this certainly requires a decision because it is the last act of this very long play that has gone on for thousands of years. Let's just think about some of the things that Satan has put in place to take away from the teachings of Jesus in the Bible. First of all, we know that Jesus is the creator. Satan has placed science and evolution in the place of Jesus. Jesus said one day there is a judgment coming in which each person must take their place. Satan says, there is no judgment. Jesus said, if you break my Ten Commandments, you have sinned. Satan says, there is no such thing as sin. Make mistakes, maybe, but there is no such thing as sin. But for those who want to be Christians, Jesus says, 
I forgive sins, no one else can forgive sins. But Satan says to them, I can forgive sins, but you must do so many good works. Jesus says that we don't have to do that. By faith we believe that he can cleanse us and repent from our sins. Jesus says that if you have done wrong, you can come straight to me. You don't need to go through anyone else. Satan says differently. Satan says, when you've done wrong, you go to a priest and you confess your sins. You can go through the saints. These are the mediators who will take you to God. Jesus said, no, I died for you. I'm the mediator who can link you with my Father in heaven. Jesus calls his Father, our Father, in the Lord's Prayer. Satan gives us the Holy Father in Rome as an alternative. Just before Jesus died, he took the Last Supper with his disciples. Satan has given the world the Eucharist, the Mass. Jesus died once. In the Mass, it appears that Christ dies every day. Christ's death was once and for all people. And when Jesus left to go to heaven, he said that he was going to send another comforter. He himself was the one who comforts us in all our sadnesses, in all our sins, in all our sorrows. Satan has never comforted anybody. Satan has set up a follow-on from Christ. He has put a substitute in the world. He has put the papacy in the world as the follow-on from Christ, the representative of Jesus in the world. I prefer to believe the Bible because the Bible gives me the true information that I need. And this is what this last act in this play is building up to, a huge confrontation between the two opposing parties, between the small group who stand for Jesus, like the three who refused to bow to the image, and all the world, for all the world will now follow Satan. When you look around you and see the people in the shop next to you, the people travelling on the buses and trains, the people on the roads and the cars, you wonder how all those hundreds and thousands and millions of people are going to make a decision. How will they ever know? This is what God needs missionaries for, to be able to give people this information. This is what this DVD is aiming to do. Because in the world, God has placed a magnet. And this magnet is the magnet of truth and holiness. Now what is truth? Truth is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. You see, there is only one truth. Jesus is the truth. There is not a multiplicity of truths in the Bible, just one. And so Jesus has revealed himself in the Bible. He's revealed himself here in all his words and his actions and his commands and his promises to us. Jesus is the truth. And he has placed that knowledge through faithful Christians in the world. But he's also placed something else in the world as well because it's so easy to believe, just to say, I believe. But Jesus is placed in the world of truth and holiness, like Adam and Eve were at the beginning. Holy, happy people. Holiness means character. Jesus showed us what the character that he was looking for, because he lived it. He came to the world just like us. And Jesus was meek and lowly. Jesus was long-suffering and patient. Jesus was always joyful. 
He had the character of heaven. So when we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, this is what it means to be like Jesus and to have the character of Jesus. And that is what will divide the world. A magnet, as you probably remember from school days, either repels or attracts. And so Jesus, in the lives of good Christian people in the world, those who follow him fully, is revealing himself to the world. Many will hate them. Many will deride and sneer, just like the hostages that refuse to come out of the door. They will be repelled by what they see, but there will be others who will be attracted, and it will be this that will divide the world into the Bible says the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. It will happen. Right at this very last stage of this last act, another character comes on the stage, a prophetic character. It is the United States. And here we find that the United States will join hands with the papacy and the two will work together as agents in the world to bring about this one world, the one worship in the world. We discover in the Bible that the papacy is given its power and its seat and its authority by the dragon. In prophecy, the dragon is Satan. Satan is behind everything in this world. And now, when we read in this prophecy about the United States, we discover that the United States is given its power also by the dragon. The same power is given to it to bring the world into one world government. And that world will be a world of worship. Because America, by terrible deceptions, will make the world believe that Satan and his agent is the leading God in the world. In order to do this, America will even make it appear as if fire comes down from heaven. And if you see something, you see it, you hear it, you experience it with other people, then you too could be deceived. But Jesus warned when he was on earth, when people say, here is Christ, or there is Christ, or deceptions happen, don't go and look. This also means don't even turn on your television when you hear things like this. Don't allow your human curiosity to deceive you, because the devil in those last days has power over the mind. Revelation tells us that three frogs, unclean spirits, will also be in the earth. The devil has many angels in this earth. He brought with him a third of the angels from heaven, all corrupted like him. And now in this final act, they're working together as never before. And so the world is filled with the spirits of devils. At this last time, there is a final rallying call given by just the few Christians that are in the world. And they are saying, Babylon, this awful confederacy, is fallen. It is broken. It is finished. Don't be part of it. It's also appealing. Worship God. Give glory to him. Fear God. Put God first in your life, the true God. Worship him that made heaven and earth. Don't worship this confederacy. If we are to worship the God that created the heaven and the earth, he made the heavens and the earth in six days. He made the sun, the moon, the stars, the solar system. And on the seventh day, he rested. And he called that day the Sabbath. He gave it as a rest day to everybody in the world. How wonderful to be given a day off by God. 
when we're told we don't have to do any work but have a peaceful, quiet day with him. And in the final, last call that goes out to the world, we're told to worship God. The final message that comes is, don't worship this confederacy. Don't worship the dragon. Don't worship any power in the world that asks you to give worship in, to them instead of to God. But worship only God. The warning is that great penalties will come at the end to those who worship any other than God. Finally, there will be the greatest cry go out throughout the whole world and that will be the final call to the multitudes of the world given by just a very few. It will be a message from God himself and those people will give that message with power, with light, with glory, with the strength of God. And that message is, come out of her, my people. God can see in the world, he still has those, maybe those who are afraid of their friends, afraid to break with their families. And he says, come out now before it's too late come out of the hell hole of where the hostages are held. Come on my side where I love you and comfort you. I am the true God. I will receive you and you shall be my sons and daughters. But come out before it is too late. In this final act, plagues will fall just like they fell on Egypt. And this will be God showing his true power. Till now, he has pleaded with people. But then he will begin to avenge himself on those who have spoiled his creation. He says that even those who have destroyed the world, the ones who have destroyed the animals of the animal kingdom, the ones who have damaged the ecology, it's his world and he will destroy them. It says that in the book of Revelation. But more than that, at the end of the seven plagues, the people in the world will not have changed. They will not choose to repent. In fact, they will continue blaspheming God. Can you imagine this stage of action? The action now is fast. The action is strong and still that small band remain faithful. Now they're surrounded by good angels who are caring for them amidst all the fiery darts of the enemy, the hatred of Satan towards those few who have stood against him is immense. And then something happens. The heavens will open. It will be as if the sun is shining at midnight and as they look up, they see a cloud coming, nearer and nearer to the earth. Jesus told at his crucifixion that they would see Jesus coming in all his glory, with all the angels of heaven, and now it's happening. Satan still moves his followers in anger at what is happening as the power of the good angels defeats them. Those who have followed Satan will now wail as they've never wailed before. They will see that what those few Christians have said over the years was true. They didn't listen to those appeals. Now they rush on those who told them not to listen. They will rush on the false religions they will tear them limb from limb in their fury as they realize that they have been tricked and deceived. But that cloud comes closer and closer. It comes with music. It comes with the choirs of heaven. The angels sing as they approach the earth. Then the trumpet of God will sound. It's only been heard once before, and that was on Mount Sinai 
when God gave the Ten Commandments. And as that trumpet sounds, it will wax louder and louder and louder, and then the Lord will call and he will say, Awake, 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 come forth from the graves. And all around the world, graveyards will burst open as people who have been sleeping in death break forth from the graves. The book of Isaiah in the Bible tells us they will come forth singing. They will come out and they will be changed. They may have gone to their death following an accident or cancer, but now they will be young again. They will be restored, just like Adam and Eve. Jesus doesn't touch the earth. Jesus is in the cloud above the earth. Paul tells us this in Thessalonians chapter 4. And now we look at those who were around us, the ones who hated Christians so much, they will be running to the mountains. They will be calling on the rocks to cover them. Do you remember Adam and Eve hid from God? It will be just the same on a bigger scale. And as Jesus comes, there will be voices and thunderings and lightnings. There will be hail falling on the earth, each hailstone the size of a car battery. Can you imagine the destruction that will happen? And then there will be the biggest earthquake that the world has ever seen. Everything will be destroyed. But Jesus will call to those who were living to see him come. Just a small group. The last hostages that came out. They will all be there. Those who have raised from the dead will be there. And together everyone will lift off the earth and Christ will take them to heaven with him. Christ does not want to come down here. There is nothing to rule down here. The earth is in ruins. The wicked are dead. Evil will be finished and evil will be destroyed. God tells us that the former things will not be remembered nor come into mind. He will destroy root and branch by the final fires, everything to do with evil. Then he will recreate this world. He will start again. And those people who have had their names put in his book of life, they will come as the ones who will be the new citizens of the new world. This has been the appeal of making sense of it all. From the very beginning, we are hostages. We don't have to be hostages. But can you see the fate if we choose to remain on Satan's side? He hates the sons and daughters of God. But Jesus loves us. And one day, he will wipe away all the tears the years that the caterpillar has spoiled, that the locust has destroyed, meaning what Satan has spoiled, he will restore. The dumb will sing, the deaf will hear, those in wheelchairs, they will run and leap and jump in this world made new. Won't it be wonderful? God will make up everything that we have lost in this world. And many, many of us have lost good and important things in this world. It will all be given to us double and more than double as he wipes the tears from our eyes. We shall no longer be hated. And I read somewhere that this kingdom of God, because God will come and live in this world, heaven will move to earth because this is where Jesus died to make it possible. And from then on, the years of gladness will roll on forever. Don't you want to be part of that? This world hasn't got anything to offer. Forget the systems of this world, the institutions of this world, the religious institutions of this world. Forget them all and look at Jesus. 
and look to his truth and be drawn by his holiness so that you can be part of that final band. What a wonderful conclusion that will be. What a difference between the pieces now that don't make sense and the complete lives that God wants us to have. I pray that this will be your decision. I want to pray with you now. Father, our loving Heavenly Father, you've heard the words of all these presentations. I pray that somebody listening may have been touched. I pray that someone may make a decision so that they may go through to those years of gladness and leave behind this sad, angry, unhappy world. We know that this last act is about to break upon the world. We know that Jesus is soon to come to put an end to all that has disturbed our peace and deceived us. Father, may we see Jesus and him only. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus who loved us so much. Amen. Amen. Amen.